Thank you, everyone. So we are trying new technology. Let me know if you can't hear it. So I'm here to talk about implementing NIST 800-171 in decentralized and centralized environments. The stuff I talk about today will work in both, or if you're less like we are, the combination environment. So I'm Laura Elkin, cybersecurity specialist at University of Cincinnati. I have a unique role where I am a technical person in the Office of Research, and I am not directly reporting to the Office of Information Security, even though I have cybersecurity in my title. So I'm here exclusively for our researchers. We have had a whole bunch of new regulations that have come across with cybersecurity components and requirements. This is showing up in awards. It is showing up across the university, and it applies to our researchers who do not understand what this means in a real life situation. They can read, they can research, they understand how it applies, but how does it apply at my university? So that's what I'm here for. I also help them implement them. I help our IT teams implement them in a way that supports our researchers and allows them to still do the research they wanna do. So as you can see, we're R1 Public University Land Grant. We do cover fundamental ITAR, EAR, and CUI research. So we cover the full breadth. Um, we have quite a bit in federal awards. We have 16, 615 million in research expenditures and 789 federal research awards in 2022. So as you can see, NIST 800-171 is important to us. Let me add a couple other reasons why we've chosen NIST 800-171 as our primary framework across the university. Now keep in mind that's our guiding framework. We do not have every iota of our environment implemented this way. Um, obviously, we have students, so we have to accommodate them as well. But NIST 800171 covers a large amount of regulatory requirements. And if we implement 800171 as a framework, then we've covered a wide variety of our requirements FERPA, PCI, uh, all of the regulatory requirements on that side. Then it helps us with CUI. And very shortly, it'll help us with our tax stuff, our FAFSA information that we all get so that we can help our students come to our universities it needs to be covered. Uh, for those of you who may not already be aware, uh, in the next approximately nine months, tax information is going to be required to be covered as CUI and have NIST 800-171. So if we start with NIST 800-171, then our compliance for all of the remaining regulations is that much easier. Now we're just adding a couple more things. So here's a little bit about our environment. As I mentioned, we have a mixed environment. We do have central services, we have Information Security Central, we do have a central HR, and we have public safety, finance, all of these things that are needed for NIST 800-171. But we also have departments and they have all duplicated services. So as we all know, what that leads to is our best friend, Shadow IT. Okay. So how do we get to decentralization? Our researchers absolutely love that personalized touch. Our IT teams know their researchers. They know what they need. Our researchers know those department IT teams by name. They don't call up a central IT number. They call up Nick. That's who they need. That's who they ask their questions. And Nick knows which ones need attention fast and which ones can be a little more patient and he responds appropriately. That builds the trust and loyalty. 
there is a level of loyalty with the department ITs that is incredible. And if I have trouble with somebody, if I pull in my IT teams at the departments, I get attention quickly because they trust those people. Yes, innovation can be faster, can be. Um, centralized services does allow fast innovation. People may not believe it and people may struggle to see it, but it does allow it. And we talked about the personalized touching of the faculty members. Everybody loves to feel like they're number one. And when you've got a centralized organization, trying to help 5,000 faculty and staff. Let's not forget about our 50,000 students. You lose that. So this is how decentralization comes up. And it's also attractive to new incoming faculty and staff. But with every decentralized environment, we have our challenges. I have policies that are written at a university level and each department implements them. They're required, but they're implemented a little bit differently. We also have faculty members who cross into multiple departments. So when they're in one department, they struggle because the policy is implemented much firmer. It's tighter. There are more controls. They have their reasons, but they go to the other one is not as difficult. I also have inconsistency with evaluating risk. We've moved away from saying everything has to have all these controls. We're moving towards risk. Look at the risk. Do I worry about the stuff I can Google as much as I worry about my CUI? Absolutely not. I wanna make sure I protect it. I wanna make sure I have controls so that we don't have somebody sneaking in but I'm not as worried. If I have decentralized, I have these risks being evaluated differently. I have them being decided differently on how to remediate them. We have different processes. Departments have unique environments, which is great. It is fantastic. The environment for my engineering school is incredible. It's perfect for them. It doesn't work for my college of medicine. They have their own environment, which is great for them. Everybody's a little bit different, but that also comes with a resource leveling is different. So a college that doesn't bring in nearly the research money that another one does has less IT, which can be problematic. And then of course, our favorite duplication of resources. Currently, I have a lot of inventory tools. We do a job, it's a pretty good job of inventorying what we have out there, but there's no centralized inventory. I know what CUI systems I have. Engineering knows what systems they have. College of Medicine knows. None of them talk to each other, which is a challenge, especially when you're trying to nail down what you have to protect. So University of Cincinnati looked at all of this and said, you know what, centralization would be perfect. I'd love it. I can't move us that fast in time for us to be compliant with CMMC. That's next year. Tax stuff next year. All these regulations, that was three years ago. I can't move us fast enough to centralization. So how do we do this? We started with writing all of our policies with NIST 800-171 in mind. And we developed an umbrella system with a steering committee. We have a steering committee that is filled with leadership. These are the movers and shakers in their departments. These are the people that make decisions. They are part of this. They help us develop guidelines answer questions. They help us put our standards together. They define what tools are going to be used. And then we push them down. Each one of these robots is my department's. They then take those guidelines and implement them how is best in their department. 
For example, engineering, they have individual enclaves of individual systems. That's what looks best for them. College of Medicine has a more centralized for them system. They have to develop their own types of enclaves. A little bit more about the steering committee. Here we go. It's a multidisciplinary, no, multidisciplinary leadership group. So we pulled our leaders from HR. Remember in your framework, you've got things like training, background checks. You've got these things that are primarily HR focused. HR usually runs them because that's what they do. They need to be on board. They need to understand the importance of background checks. Why do we have to do background checks and what level? And then help me implement it. Help me push it out and explain the importance. And oh, by the way, while I've got my blinders on, help me not over scope. Because that's what I did the first time around. We presented a new policy. It was great. Except that HR looked at it and said, you're saying that every single person who logs into the system has to have a background check. Did you think about that? We didn't think that far. We didn't look at it that way. They help us with that. And that goes, same thing for finance, department IT, faculty, legal. Oh yeah, we're changing policies. Legal needs to be involved. We're doing things like background checks. Again, legal needs to be involved. These are just some of our people. We have, uh, we just added facilities, our director of facilities, our physical stuff. So all these people to come together, they're making decisions. We have people in the background, our leaders in the space are myself, my CISO. Uh, we are bringing in some more compliance people. They help us develop the policies, the standards, the recommendations. And then we bring it to these people and say, look, this is what we need. This is what we need. Please look at it and give us your feedback. How does it work? Is it going to work? Does it meet all the requirements? Does it meet your requirements and can it be implemented and how? And we get feedback from them. From there, we just keep doing a cycle. They're designed to make decisions. These are not our boots on the ground. These are not people implementing because we need them to say yes. Or we need them to say no, but, and they do. We have had cases where we have a challenge we need help with. We have an idea. We need somebody to help us come up with the answer. So they create the working groups. They pick who in their organization is most impacted by whatever it is. Our latest one, we need a compliance tool that helps us document and store all this evidence in one place. I hate my spreadsheets. I live in them. How many people here deal with compliance with spreadsheets and all of their compliance is spreadsheet based? Yes, very common. Um, for CMMC, that's a nightmare because I can provide all that to them. So we need it someplace centralized. We put together a working committee. We had our steering committee make recommendations. Who, who are the people who can give us concrete feedback feedback that's useful, not just noise, and who can help us with this. And we got an answer. They provide the con communication and then they endorse it. Remember, these are the leaders. These are the people that we look to. And they're saying, I've looked at this. I've taken this back to my team. I've gotten the feedback. This is good. This is what we're doing. And this is why. Some of our wins, we have had increased awareness of the importance of NIST 800 -171. It's no longer just a whole bunch of letters and numbers. It means something. We've aligned our policies with the requirements with published standards. So now I have a project that comes in and I have standards. I pull them up. I say, these are your minimum requirements. 
You want to go further? Great, let's talk. We've identified and onboarded compliant email and file storage. A previous one wasn't working. So that was one of the first tasks we did. We brought on something that worked. I mentioned the compliance documentation tool. We've established mandatory tools for central log management, AV, EDR, and FIM. So no longer is the shadow IT in charge of this stuff. They still have other stuff. But for this, that's mandatory. If you have to have NIST 800-171 in our environment, that's what you have to have is that list. And we've also published standards for the CUI project assessment, physical security, privacy training, uh, privacy statements. I put together a welcome to this crazy world document. Talks about the whole history of it, why we're doing it. Many of the frequently asked questions, somebody asked me a question, it goes in there. Why? Um, this gives an introduction to why are we having to do this for a project that came out of this. I had a faculty member say, look, you approach me and say, I've got to do this and I don't have the history. It'd be helpful if somebody could just say, here's why we have to do it and explain it. So this has allowed us to put this all together, push it out and continue to go forward. Some of our next goals is, like I mentioned, we are centralizing, but we're going to continue to check off all of those 110 controls across the university. We're going to continue to provide more support for the small enclaves that have been developed for our projects and give them more centralized support and more leadership support. So with that, I'll open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. As a faculty member, you talk about shadow IT, but one of the things that happened to me was I put in for a grant for a certain amount of infrastructure and it, it didn't occur to me until I got the grant about 800, 171, when all of a sudden the infrastructure people freaked out because there's half a million dollars coming in for computer stuff that they didn't approve of. So what do you do in those circumstances? So that's an education part, and I take that on me. Because you're right, sometimes it's a surprise. Guess what? Which are my favorites. I am in the process of going from department to department and explaining who is likely to get these, explaining that these are questions to ask at the proposal stage and ask, is it possible that I might have to do this? Do I need to consider this as part of my infrastructure? And that way we can have that separate pricing structure and it can be built in and you can prepare properly because you're right, there are additional controls, which means costs. It, it's just a reality. And right now, a lot of times those surprise projects, the department takes the burden on. There's gonna become a threshold where the department says, I, I don't think so, stop it. So we need to educate our faculty members that these are questions to start asking. And we continue my department, um, Research, Security, and Ethics, continues to communicate to our federal partners. Please tell us, communicate that out, that this is a possibility. We can handle it. We have pot statements to say we can handle it. We need to know because a surprise when we get an award, we are already months behind because they want to start as soon as the awards sign. I still got to build my infrastructure. And now I have frustrated faculty members and it's not any of our fault. So it, it's about having those partnerships, it's about communicating, it's about reaching out to the faculty and explaining that this is out in the world, this is out there, but also reaching our federal partners and saying, please communicate. You know, we're happy to accommodate it. We'd like to know sooner. 
Thank you. Hi. In a decentralized environment, um, how do you get assurance that your decentralized departments are implementing the controls appropriately? I have communication with my IT managers. I actually have monthly meetings with them. If we have a project, I sit down with them. When I meet with faculty members, I bring my IT departments along. So if I meet, I recently had a meeting with one faculty member out of engineering. I had faculty member, there's also export controlled. I had my export control officer, and I also had my IT team. That involved my IT manager from that department, as well as their key resource who was dedicated to that specific sub department. We all sat down at the table. We actually went from room to room for a tour of what the project entails. And it involves a whole lot of communication and a lot of regular touch bases. I have a specific form they have to fill out and I monitor and look at what they're doing for their controls. Keeping in mind, I do have that technical background to be able to understand what they're building and it's trust but verify. We do have to develop a trust with them and that's through relationships. Hi, so I'm actually, um, I'm working with uh, another university. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Can, can you hear me? You, I'm yeah. hard of hearing, so. Oh, okay, uh, let, me, let me try a little better. So I'm also, um, I'm working with another university on this same problem, um, a little bit less decentralized, but, um, <laughs> I know when you list a, you, you put up a list of a variety of, of controls you need to put in place. One of the things I it seems to me is the hardest thing to implement. Some of those controls are about change management and configuration management. So I was wondering how that's working for you, we or have, how you've addressed that. So you're asking about change management and how we change and configuration that? management. I'm finding that so we're an organization that does not have. Uh, and certainly and we, our departments do not have change management and configuration management policies or processes in place. And to me, that seems to be a much bigger hurdle than the technology controls that need to be put into place. So you're right. Processes are absolutely a beast. Technology, I can slap Splunk in. That's an app, a big deal. Processes. Um, Configuration management and change management. We have centralized change management, but we do mandate that they also report up. And I check. I'm tied in with change management, so I check my projects. I can only control my world, which is CUI. I also keep an eye on the export control if they've got something as well for them. But I monitor to make sure it's happening. We have InfoSec. Also aware of what our restricted systems are, they monitor to make sure that the systems that are high impact or are restricted are coming up through there. At, but you're right, it's a weak process. And that's one of the ones that we are working on improving because it's a beast. Okay, <clears throat> I think we have time for one more quick question. Hi, I have a question about your steering committee, which is, did you have any troubles getting non-cybersecurity related people to serve on it? Absolutely not. Um, our cybersecurity, myself and our CISO, we are co-leaders of this, and we pulled all of our pulled all of our chips out of our hat and said, hey, please, please. But seriously, we keep these meetings very high level. We do not go down in the weeds with these groups because they're not technical. And if you go too far down the weeds, they turn off. Um, we remember, we reminded them financial, this is expensive. And oh, by the way, if you don't pay this, the fines are bigger. We reminded them of that HR. We reminded them, we have to do this fines again. And people losing grants mean people leave. It's talking to them on terms they know. And that's how we reached out to them. My physical security guy, I'm putting cameras in. Do you want to have a say in this? And he was right there. Yeah, I'll, 
don't you put stuff I don't like on there. So it's about finding their common language and then keeping our meetings up here, up at their level, because they're leaders, they're not in the weeds, and they will so out. So we have actually had a lot of luck with it through those conversations. All right, thank you very much for your time.